Our second scripture lesson is the third letter of John. If, uh, it, it looks a little funny in your uh, bulletin. It's because it's one of those letters that's uh, short. Second John and Third John are very short. Um, they don't have chapters, uh, just verses. Um, that's how brief they are. Uh, it's a letter that seems very mundane, um, very, very simple. But in many ways, uh, very profound. Hear this, uh, the word of the Lord from the Apostle John. The Elder, that's John's title for himself, the Elder. To my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health. And that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear <coughs> that my children are walking in the truth. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even <coughs> though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought therefore to show hospitality to such people so that they may, we may work together for the truth. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God, and anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. Demetrius is well spoken by, of by everyone, and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. I have much to write you, but I do not want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace to you. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. Lord God, may your word come alive this morning, that it might be for us a source of life. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Week five, we're in week five, uh, actually uh, um, uh, coming to uh, the close of this series that we've been doing on the Daniel Plan, Whole Life Health, this, this focus on being um, whole as the people of God, as disciples of Jesus in the ways that we follow. Uh, and we've, uh, we've said that this series is grounded in this reality, this truth, that indeed uh, we have been created just a little lower than the angels. God has created us with dignity. Um, and it's for that reason, because we've been created with dignity, that we attend to our physical health, our mental health, our emotional health, what we eat, how we keep our bodies fit for service to the kingdom. All of this is in light of the fact that we have been created with dignity and purpose. And so as we've been moving through, we talked about uh, the word being central. Um, we talked about the, the Lord's promise of abundance, that the abundance of the creation is to be enjoyed. He promises a land flowing with milk and honey and more. Um, we talked about uh, the, the care of our bodies. Um, again, a body that is fit for the kingdom. And the care of our minds, thinking the thoughts of God, um, challenging ourselves to to think carefully about life, what we believe, and how we understand the world to be put together. And today we think about 
the importance of our, uh, not just emotional health, but our relational health. Uh, in the Daniel plan, uh, Pastor Rick Warren, who, uh, who's one of, the, uh, one of the folks who put this uh, series together, um, they say it this way, they say that this part of the Daniel plan is the secret sauce. So the, uh, you know, kind of like McDonald's um, and the Big Mac has its secret sauce. Um, this is the secret sauce of the Daniel plan. This is what really um, flavors it and brings it all together. That without, without a, a, a commitment and attention given to our relational health, um, all of the rest of it, keeping a fit body, keeping a healthy diet, um, all of those other pieces um, will come and they'll go. The challenge that we face as American Christians uh, are the stories that we have heard um, from the time that we were young. The traditional American hero runs counter, and I'm, hear me clearly, okay? This is not an anti-American um, diatribe. I, I'm, not, I'm not being unpatriotic. I'm, I'm going to call attention to this. I'm calling attention to um, traditional stories that we hear that run contrary to the gospel. One of the ways that we come to believe what we believe is through the stories we hear. And the stories that we have all heard con consistently in one form or another are stories about American heroes. And we are impoverished relationally. In other words, our relational life suffers because of our adherence to these stories that <coughs> elevate the American hero and what the American hero ought to look like. What is the challenge that the American hero poses to us? You know, the, the American hero um, are individualists, right? Um, American heroes are those who go it alone. Um, it, the way that this is put in, um, in Benjamin Franklin's um, kind of verbiage is people who can lift themselves up by their bootstraps. I've said this before, I, I don't know about you, but um, if you try and lift yourself up by your bootstraps, um, you will be, we'll all get a, a nice laugh at it because that's impossible to lift yourself up by your own bootstraps, but that is that is um, what's at the heart of the American story, whether it's, whether it's the comic book heroes, um, there's the classic um, from, uh, from some um, generations here, John Wayne, right? The rugged American, um, this is the classic Western hero who um, goes it alone, um, who, who fights the enemy single-handedly and with one eye sometimes. Um, <laughs> You know, there's, there's the, that is the John Wayne of the newer generation, you know, of the, the generation of the, the 80s and 90s, Rambo. You know, Sylvester Stallone, again, what it, he's armed with his own guts and weapons and muscle, and that's it. And he can do what 50 people could never do. The classic, the, the classic American hero certainly is, is the man of steel. Now, you know, here's, here, here is a little aside. You know what about all of these heroes? They're white. They're men. You know, so we have very few real classic heroes who um, are any other color other than white. There's a problem there. And, um, and they're all men. Maybe that's part of the problem with the way these stories goes. But, but the classic American hero has left us impoverished. Because we, we tend to approach life believing that storyline that I ought to be able to I ought to be able to live like Rambo, like John Wayne, like Superman. I ought to be able to do it on my own. And we're left um, like a lonely superhero out in the wilderness, or like the cowboy. You know, the, again, the classic western has the hero doing what? The hero rides off into the sunset. 
by himself, looking for his next um, town to save, but always alone. And it leaves us, um, it, buying into this storyline leaves us poor. And, and it makes a mess out of our communities. It makes a mess out of what God intended for our lives as his people created in his image collectively, not just individually. God's purpose from the beginning is a family, a community of people who are bound together by the indwelling of his spirit. Now, you might ask this question. You might say, well, but didn't Jesus, go? if, if Jesus is to be our model, didn't Jesus go it alone? It, didn't he do it all by himself? Now, uh, there's probably a single instant on the cross. Once, one moment in all the expanse of time in history where Jesus is truly alone, when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet note that, that even at that point, even then, Jesus is crying out to the Father. You see, um, Jesus comes to embody um, what the real king of Israel ought to look like. You know, so we have, to, we have to put him next to Solomon. Solomon's wisdom there in Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes, most of it is probably written by King Solomon and probably later in his life, and it reflects the wisdom of a man who is who's looking back on his life that is filled with um, big harems, lots of women, um, lots of prestige all around the world at that time. He was well known for his wisdom and his, uh, and his buildings, um, his, uh, all that he does in Israel. He has wealth um, beyond um, counting. He's built a, a temple that is um, remarkable. And yet he is looking back on his life and he says, Here I am sitting in my old age alone. What vanity. It's meaningless that I come to the end of my life and I am alone. I've built an empire. I've gathered wealth. I've, I've shared um, in, in deep conversation with the wisest people in the world. For what? To sit here on my throne as an old man alone wondering what is the purpose of it all. And here comes Jesus. Jesus who embodies the wisdom of Solomon. Here is the one who is greater than Solomon. Jesus even says that. The one, that, the one greater than Solomon is now here. The one greater than Moses. The one greater than David. Jesus is greater than all. And Jesus embodies Solomon's wisdom. You don't have to teach Jesus to value community. So here's the thing. Make no mistake. Apart from that moment on the cross, Jesus does not go it alone. Jesus doesn't value um, anything close to the American hero myth. Jesus, um, throughout his ministry, the, the, the snapshot, the, the glimpses were given are a Jesus who prays and communicates with the Father on a regular basis. The Spirit indwells him. The, the relationship he has with the, the Father and the Spirit is his primary community. But, but we shouldn't stop there. Don't think that because Jesus is the Son of God that he doesn't value, simply value the friendship of his disciples. <laughs> Why would we um, even be tempted to think that Jesus didn't find energy and support and encouragement from Peter and James and John and the rest of the disciples? The same as we find um, good fellowship and friendship crucial um, to our lives. Jesus depends upon his disciples 
This is what makes um, sense, the most sense of his disappointment with them in the Garden of Gethsemane. Couldn't you stay awake with me for um, an hour? Here at my time of greatest need, I'm turning to my friends. This is Jesus, the Son of the living God, fully human, fully divine, and yet he turns to his friends in disappointment, but he turns to them nonetheless. This is, um, this is probably why Jesus says, look, um, I know that family is important, and it's so important that I'll redefine it so that even if, if my family has disowned me because they're embarrassed, well, that's okay because my family are those who um, follow me. These are my family, my brothers and my sisters. It's Jesus' way of saying to us, um, look around, look around, look next to you. Say hello to your brother and sister. Look behind you. These are your brothers and sisters. Um, these, we are the folks who God is calling us to walk through life together with. Make no mistake that, that Jesus embodies Solomon's wisdom. Even at the Garden of Gethsemane, he is crying out to his Father in the power of the Spirit. He is, um, he is um, unified with them relationally, and he trusts them. He longs for their help and their support in this most challenging time of his life as he faces the cup that he's been called to drink. He relies upon others. Ought we not live the same way? There is an incomparable value of community. Community can't be replaced. Community can't be um, circumvented. We cannot become disciples of Jesus individually. Whether that means um, attending to the Daniel plan, getting our bodies fit, um, staying on track in terms of healthy eating, um, or all of the other aspects of what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. We cannot do it. We will not be found. Jesus will not sell it, say to us individually, well done, good and faithful servant. Um, when all is said and done, he won't be able to say that to us in quite the same way as he will when we do it in community with others. You know, this um, token... <clears throat> Um, J.A.R. Tolkien in the Lord of the Rings trilogy <coughs> captures this, this nature of community in a beautiful, beautiful way. You know, he, he runs counter to that American um, hero myth, right? Because um, think about it. Who is the hero? You know, this debate goes on, especially, you know, for, for people who are big Tolkien fans, Lord of the Rings fans. Who's the hero in the story? Frodo, oh, well, Frodo, would Frodo complete the journey without Samwise Gamgee? Or would they be able to complete it without what um, Aragorn and, um, and the rest do at, uh, at the gate to Mordor? You know, so in other words, you know, Tolkien captures this notion that, that um, we all have our part to play. And there may be times in life where we are, we act um, remarkably as an individual. But it, it is never, uh, the, the kingdom of God is not simply um, adding up individual performances. The kingdom of God is about our collective effort. Um, is about the power of our relational community. It's about, the, it's about the, the power of our trust and dependency upon each other. You see, um, Jesus is humble and meek. It's because Jesus is humble and meek that he is willing to depend even upon these frail, mistaken disciples of his. He knows how, he knows how unpredictable and, and undependable they are. 
And yet he relies upon them to the very end. He trusts them. And we're called, um, we're called upon to surround ourselves with fellow travelers, pilgrims on the way. You know, Solomon's wisdom is, um, is in many ways pulling at this idea of travelers. A traveler who's traveling alone and has a fall and no one to pick her up. Um, how terrible this is. A traveler who's traveling alone and has no one to keep him or her warm in the cold um, of the wilderness. What a sad state of affairs. The Lord has provided us each other and others. The Lord has gifted us with each other that we might travel together, that we might pilgrimage in this life together, that we might find support and encouragement to do the right thing, to, to be the kind of people who God has called us. It's not easy being a disciple in the 21st century in America. It's not easy. It doesn't come naturally. And we face opposition. And the only ways that we can face opposition and be found faithful is when we do it together. So we pray. We trust that God's Spirit, that the Lord's Spirit, um, as, as the Spirit unified Father and Son, that that same spirit would unify us, that we would hear, that we would hear the Apostle John's um, simple mundane letter in light of what it is, this call to community, to love one another in truth. You know, how does John end that letter? He says this, he says, look, there's lots that I could write. Um, here's why the letter is short. There's a lot that I could write, but I would rather see you face to face. John recognizes the value of this intimate unity with his brothers and sisters to whom he's writing. And he longs for, no, he isn't just about instructing them. It's not just about, um, about getting the order right or the rules right. or the, He wants to commune with them. He wants to be with them. He wants to be at the table with them. He wants to, um, to encourage them to their face, to pray together, to hear their voice, and allow them to hear his. This is what should inspire our commitment to community here. And may God find us faithful as we pursue it. Let's pray. Holy God, we do ask that your spirit your spirit that makes us um, one as you are one, Father, Son, and Spirit, um, that your spirit would be at work in us, creating in us a unity of purpose, a unity of mind. Lord God, we thank you and praise you that you've given us each other for this journey of life. And, and we ask simply that you would humble us to rely upon each other, to trust each other, um, to love each other, even in the midst of all of our um, frailties uh, and, and uh, inconsistencies. Help us, Lord, to love each other in the way that you want um, your people to be of one mind, of one heart. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.